Hey everybody, it's Earth Day, uh, and I gotta say, who's not wearing green now, boss? Oh, you got me. Yeah, you're right. On St. Patrick's Day, I got you. You know what I'll say though, Liz? As an avid gardener, I can tell you that you do not get good, lush, green plants without amazing soil. It's really all about the soil. So I've got this brown shirt on, earth tones, so I think I'm still on theme. I'll allow it this time. Uh, so... For Earth Day, we want to talk about recycling rates. Um, we thought it was a really relevant topic. Um, Matt and City Council often get really good presentations at City Council meetings. And we know folks aren't necessarily like ready to like strap in and watch 12 hours of City Council some days. So uh, I want to thank the ESD department, Environmental Services. This is their presentation. We're just highlighting some of the bits for you. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about recycling rates and why they're going up. So and me. their impact on the, on the garbage rate, the cost yeah. for all of our rate payers. So this actually has a big impact on everyone. In fact, you may have just gotten in your mailbox a letter from the city advertising a rate increase as high as potentially 17%. So this is a big, big issue for everyone. Sorry, Liz, go, go ahead. All right. So you can see my screen, right? Yes. Excellent. All right. So to start things off, we can't talk about anything in the past year or so without talking about COVID-19's impact. And I think we can see that in this chart right here. Right, Matt? Yeah. So we've seen, you know, garbage uh, usage, uh, the amount of waste that our haulers collect goes up in a really predictable about 2% a year uh, rate. And recycling has been pretty flat, as you can see. And then if you look over to the right, while it may not look dramatic, that is a pretty big increase from 19 to 20 and a much larger increase on the recycling front, which might sound like good news, but uh, we're going we're gonna to get into that. Yeah. Um, recycling rates uh, more than doubled, which sounds great at first. Like, oh, great. People are recycling. Unfortunately, uh, they are not recycling correctly. Uh, this is this graph shows recycling contamination. So things that maybe shouldn't be in the recycling bin ending up in there and making everything else in there not recyclable. Yeah, so if you imagine, um, and in fact, if you go back to the last slide for Wait, one sorry. second and you, you, so you see this 8% increase around trash and this, this is all residential. So the first thing we should just note is that as everyone has been sheltering in place and working remotely this past year, we've seen a big decrease in demand on the commercial waste side and a big increase on the residential side. So there's been this shift, which makes sense. People are home, so they have more that they're consuming at home and more that they need to dispose of. And you see that 8% increase. And the way that I imagine this, and it's been largely true for our family, is you know, that, that smaller black trash bin that most of us have was already close to capacity each week. And so that 8% basically represents the additional trash that people were able to kind of stuff down into that smaller black bin. Mm -hmm. And that big increase in recycling, unfortunately, isn't just that we have more cardboard to throw out. It's that we're seeing that excess waste that no longer fits in the trash bin, as we have just more waste than we've ever had before at home. And some of that's ending up in the recycling bin, as, as you were just saying. So I think we can go forward again, and that's that 33. So what that slide is showing, if you could just go back one, and then we'll get to our bins, that increase there is a almost 300 ton a day. So 33% increase in the amount of recycling that cannot be recycled. It has to go to the landfill because it's got the broken ketchup bottle in it or whatever else. We'll get into that later. But yeah, okay, let's keep going. Yeah. So this is creating a false incentive, right? Uh, if you have like filled up your garbage can, but there's no in recycling bin, you probably think like, oh, you know, like it all goes to the same place, right? Right. And it does not all go to the same place. You know, we hear that a lot. I'm glad you mentioned that, Liz. A lot of people say, well, China's not buying our recyclables and it just, you know, it doesn't really get recycled. It all just goes to the same place. It does not go to the same place. They are different waste streams. There are other folks out there in the supply chain who will buy recyclables. When you send clean recyclables, and we'll get into what you can recycle, when you send them out in your blue bin, they get recycled. And there is a whole processing uh, process around that. And 
there's value in that waste stream. When it's contaminated with non-recyclables, it does go to the landfill. And that's one of the major drivers of cost increases, as we'll see in a little bit. Yeah. So I think it's important to talk about what's not recyclable, because I think we have all committed one crime or another here. Uh, <laughs> the garbage slash food soiled containers. This is a win for me in my household, because I am the one that rinses out pasta jars, and I'm right. Um, but I've also done some of the things I, I used to think my Amazon uh, bubble wrap packages were recyclable, and they are not in your oh. bin, necessarily. And it's confusing, because those the Amazon packages for example, have a little recycling symbol on them. But if you look closely, it says at a drop-off location, meaning you have to take it to a special drop-off point for a very specific recycling process. I see the um, what looks like an, an iced latte up there. And I'm not going to name any names, but we do have an iced latte drinker in my family. And I feel like I've occasionally seen that in the recycling bin. But um, I've also been guilty of the Amazon packaging. So there's a lot here. I think the simplest thing is nothing wet and nothing with food in it. It's really easy, even a, you know, whether it's a, I, I mentioned the ketchup bottle or the pasta yeah, sauce. But yeah, the pizza box is exactly your pizza box is cardboard, seems recyclable. If it is stained with grease, it can't be recycled. And then as that mixes, as, as contaminated, recyclables or non-recyclables mix in with the other recyclables, uh, they, they can contaminate the whole thing. So the entire bin or more realistically, the entire truckload ends up just having to be diverted to the landfill and cannot be recycled. It's kind of tragic. Yeah. Um, okay, let's keep let's going. What is recyclable? Um, so like you said, a lot of plastic things have that recycled number on them. So in San Jose, uh, anything with that little recycle number symbol, one, two, three, four, five, and seven. So not six can go in the bin, paper, metal, glass. Uh, SanJoseRecycles.org is a really good uh, place for people to go check out because not only does it say what you can recycle, but like those Amazon bubble wrap packages we talk about, you can find where to drop those off. That's right. So clean, ideally dry. It doesn't have to be super dry if it's just a little bit of water, but clean, dry. And then on those plastics, um, you know, if you look, you will find the number. And if you don't find the number, probably better safe than sorry. Probably better to, to toss it in the trash. Yeah. All right, moving on. Um, the city is required uh, with your, uh, the contractor to every two years do a survey. Uh, they sample people's trash. So somebody has been going through your trash perhaps. Uh, and we get to see the results of how people are recycling. And uh, yeah, and this is how we, this is how we know what's going on. So we, this is this actually is really important. So when we negotiate our contracts with waste haulers, some of them for single family homes, and as we'll see in a moment, we have not yet negotiated this with multifamily. So if you live in a big apartment building, this, this may not have quite the impact on you today, but it will soon. Those haulers want protection in the contract against getting stuck with a bunch of contaminated recyclables because it's a it's a double hit for them financially. If they get a truckload of recyclables that they go pick up and they have to pay someone and pay for the gas and the truck and all of that, and they go pick it up and then it's contaminated, number one, they can't send it into the recycling stream where there's value. And, and while it's not a huge amount of value, it adds up. And so normally they can sell recyclables into a market that can reuse them. But if it's, if it's contaminated, they can no longer sell the cardboard, the glass, the metal. So there's no value coming in as an income stream. And then on the other end, they have to then go find a, they have to go deliver it to a landfill, which was not part of their budget. And they have to pay to dispose of it in a landfill. So it's really a big hit in terms of their budget. So their contracts protect them from that. And as our contamination rate goes up, and what you're seeing here is a third party investigator determined that last year when they did their study, we were at 51% contamination. Over half of all recycling bins or truckloads that are out there every day are too contaminated to recycle. It's going to the landfill and that's driving up cost. So I think we can go maybe to the next slide here. Uh, so yeah, this just kind of sums in that previous graph. In 2015, we had about 32% of the stuff in the recycling bins weren't actually recyclable. Before COVID, we thought we were going to be at 34. And then obviously COVID happened and we're at over half contamination. 
Right. So what, what we're seeing here is we, we had some work to do on this issue prior to COVID, and we were expecting a small increase, not small, I mean, about 8%, the 32% to 34%, it's about an 8% increase from 15 to 20. So we've seen a gradual, over those five years, a slight increase in contamination to about a third of all recycling. And there's been this belief that we've got to do more on this so that we can control costs and maximize the environmental benefit of recycling. But COVID just completely changed the equation. Instead, we saw this massive increase to now over half of all recycling going out is, is being contaminated. So we're going to have to turn that around. Some of that, I think, will naturally get better next year as people go back to work. Mm -hmm. And there's just less pressure on the waste stream at home. But uh, let's get into some of the solutions we're looking at. Uh, before we do, ah, um, this is just yeah. a quick uh, recap of the con contractor rates, you guys. Yeah, and that's what, we were, what I was describing earlier is that's the cost increase. So as contamination goes up 15 to 20%, and, and as you saw in the last slide, that's percentage points. So I think it was a 15 or 16 percentage point increase, which is actually about a 50% actual increase, but, but percentage point increase. Uh, what you have is another $8 million in costs for contractors that get passed on via the, the agreement we have with them, get passed on to ratepayers. And so the ratio is roughly two to one. Mm -hmm. For every 2% increase in contamination, and we just saw 15, 16% increase, for every 2% increase in contamination, we see a 1% increase in rates. So that's, it's a very, it's a very clear ratio. The good news is as we figure out how to get it down, we should also be able to bring down it. Yes. So this is what the city's doing about it. Um, going back to that whole incentive question, we're encouraging people to upsize their carts. Uh, you could get extra garbage stickers. Uh, I know you could get them at the library at least before the pandemic. I definitely bought some at Safeway during the pandemic. Safeway uh, and Lucky's okay. has those stickers. I didn't even know they existed, but for $6, you yeah. can get a big trash bag with the sticker on it that allows you to put extra trash next to your trash can and have it picked up. And so if you ever have a week, you have a, I don't know, you know, as, as everybody gets vaccinated, you have a party or something and you have extra trash that week, you can just use one of those bags. Yeah. Um, and then some other things the city is doing. Um, they're going to be doing a cart lid replacement pilot, which we're going to check out in a minute. But the San Jose Earthquakes, who I love, <laughs> are doing a recycle uh, right uh, campaign. So we're really just trying to hit, I think, yes, you did a great job of identifying why rates were going up and are just trying to hit that like every way they can. So that's really exciting to see. Um, yeah. But yeah, this pilot program, why don't you tell me about that, Matt? Yeah, I think it's really exciting because it's it's really it's data driven. We're going to learn a lot, so we we know we need to do more education. I mean, I, I believe that if everyone had good information and really understood this issue, which is why you and I are doing this explainer video today, I think we would see contamination rates drop close to zero. We'd be able to reduce costs, and we'd we'd be we'd be doing something great for the environment, and so. This approach is to identify a range of routes with different levels of contamination so we can learn. This is like an experiment. At some point this, um, this year, actually later this month, the, our contractors, our contracted haulers on a, on a subset of our routes where we have just measured contamination levels. So we just did this measurement on a bunch of routes to, to understand at this point how much is contaminated. They're gonna go, as they're going around, they are going to replace the blue lid on the recycling bin with a brand new shiny lid with a sticker on it that gives you that visual that we just looked at a few slides ago about what you can and cannot recycle. So it's a little bit of education. It's not the only way to do education, but it's it's one really kind of clear in your face and people will notice it. you walk out to the curb one day to pick up your recycling bin that's just been emptied and it's a brand new lid with a sticker on it. Hopefully people will stop, look at it, think about it and change behavior. And so it's just one of many potential strategies. But what I love about this is the city is then going to go back out with that third party 
investigator and have them do the analysis again on the waste streams from those same routes and understand how much it changed behavior. And if we see a big change, as in a big reduction in contamination, it will make sense for us to make the investment, the upfront investment in changing out all of the recycling lids across the city with this educational material. So it's, it's just one test, but it's an exciting one. And I love how, um, how data-driven and rigorous it is. Yeah, I'm really excited for this because it reminds me of something. You were in Watsonville when we had these, but I grew up with these. These bins, we didn't used to put all our recycling oh. in one bin. Uh, there were three and you had your trash can and it said, I'm pointing at my screen even though people can't see me doing it what went in each bins, and it was in the three most spoken languages in San Jose. I got a shot of the Vietnamese and Spanish side. One took your bottles, one took your um, paper products, and one took the plastic. And it was like really explicit, like what goes where. That's cool. So, uh, these, uh, I managed to dig these up in a backyard. Uh, so yeah. That was, a lot, that was a lot of work, huh? You had to pre-sort it. I mean, yeah, it was, but at least you knew what went in which one. So like, right. well, I like that we have one bin. Um, yeah. I do think that educational piece uh, is something that we want to bring back. It's a good uh, point. But so, anyway, so what are they, uh, what are your parents doing with those now? Well, I didn't want to out my parents' uh, dirty bins, but I will tell you at the end of the video what they're doing with them. So stay tuned. Okay. All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's have some sad news first. Uh, let's talk about Yeah. It increases. Yeah. So as I mentioned at the top of the video, I mean, I think the, the, the bad news here, and a lot of this is driven by COVID, although there's there's more to it, which I'll break down in a moment, uh, we're going to see big rate increases. So this was initially in February, what was forecast by our staff and working with the with our haulers um, was a 21% increase in rates for single family homes, 7% for multifamily. We have gotten that down a bit, it's, it's gonna be a bit lower. Um, it's looking like um, single family will probably be closer to 17%. Um, and I think multifamily will also be a little lower. Well, part of the difference, and in fact, I think the next slide would actually break probably down. help us. Yep. Yeah, yeah, this will help us better break it down. So on the single family side, which is the majority of San Joseans and certainly the majority of district 10, it's about two thirds of the city. The, the, the big drivers are, are a couple of things. Um, the, the largest actually is, is new pricing. So we renegotiated our contracts for the next 15 years and had to find haulers who were willing to pick up trash and recycling in San Jose. And to do that, they have to at least break even or do a little better than break even. And um, because of all of the mandates that have come down from the state in terms of enhancing recycling. Uh, we have one coming that, that we also talked about during the study session that has to do with reducing the amount of organic waste material going into landfills. There's just you know increasingly strict environmental regulations related to waste and recycling, which is a good thing, but it's more expensive. We also just historically, because of our contamination rate, haulers basically required higher rates to cover their costs. And on the single family side, those contracts bake in already a ability to increase or decrease rates based on contamination. And that brings us over to the almost equally large slice of the pie there, the 30% in blue, mm -hmm. which is due to contamination, which we've been talking about. That increase could have been significantly lower. In fact, without COVID, it probably would have been half or, or less of what you see there. And so our goal is to educate people, get people back to work yeah. and figure out how to get that, uh, get a reduction in rates over the next few years by reducing the contamination of recycling. That's really what we've talked about in this session. Um, one time savings was, it, it's, it's uh, savings a little confusing. Basically due to the new pricing, there was gonna be a big increase last year and we deferred it a year mm. due to COVID because COVID hit right around the time that we were going to increase rates. And we just thought it was people were losing their jobs and there was a lot of uncertainty. Unfortunately, though, part of the increase for this year is going to be making up the lost revenue from last year because we had already we have agreements and we, we have to fulfill those agreements. We had deferred it. And now that the bill's coming due and then the cost of living is, is a more 
standard thing. So this is, this is not how much it's increasing. This is how much of the increases do yeah. to these things. So if we have a 17% increase, 10% uh, of that or 1.7% is due to cost of living adjustments, which are baked into the contracts. Th a third almost, again, if it's a 17% increase, that means over 5% of that, a third of it, I know I'm doing some math here, but about a third of that is just due to contamination of the recycling stream. And that's really, that's all increase. That's the net increase there. Um, and most of that's driven by COVID and a lot of the stuff we've been talking about. And then on the multifamily side, I'll just quickly say the reason you don't see contamination captured there, that there is an increase in contamination in the recycling stream and multifamily. We have the exact same problem. The difference is the contract we have with the hauler for multifamily dwellings in San Jose does not have that variable baked in based on contamination. They are eating that cost right now. And I guarantee you that when they renegotiate their contract with the city, they're going to demand more downside protection from increased contamination rates because it's probably a huge hit to their business. Um, so it's not, it's not necessarily good news. If you're in a multifamily unit, you're getting a break uh, this year, but I wouldn't expect that to last. Yeah, uh, I live in a condo. And on the one hand, we don't really have that incentive problem. Our recycling dumpster is the size of our garbage dumpster. On the other hand, I have seen things when I take out my recycling that don't belong there. So I'm sure it'll come for me eventually. Yeah. Anyway, on to the Once we change behavior, right? That's yeah. kind of the point of this. We have time to save ourselves at least. Um, anyway, yeah. moving on. Um, so fine, rates are gonna go up for us. A lot of the things I hear, it's like, well, other cities pay this, that, and the other. Well, here's other cities. Uh, and it looks like we did make a big jump compared to everybody else, but it's not quite so bleak as that, at least on the single family front, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And actually across the board, we have anticipated as, as a big city that's got a lot of services and a lot of people and multiple contracts with multiple haulers, we have been on top of regulatory change coming from the state and we're ahead of a lot of other cities. And so while our rates are going from kind of lower half of the pack to, to, you know, kind of midpoint to maybe slightly upper half of the pack, we're expecting to see most of those other cities have rate increases that outpace our own in the years ahead. We are, we are ahead on organic waste uh, removal from, from the landfill waste stream. We're doing, um, we're doing a lot of education and have pretty smart contracts around recycling. And, and I think there's a, we, we've made a bunch of investments that mean that our rate should not increase at the same rate as most of these other cities. So I would expect San Jose to stay mid pack, pretty average, which is good news and maybe even a little under average, depending on what happens in some of these other cities. And multifamily, you know, ultimately in the long run, it's all the same cost pressures, contamination increased costs, um, you know, environmental regulations that we believe in. So, you know, more compost, more recycling, less filling of landfills. You know, the truth is filling landfills is not cheap. One of the cost drivers baked into these new contracts is always figuring out where are we going to dispose of stuff. And as we fill up landfills locally, it's going to get even more expensive to ship it outside of the region. So, you know, and certainly building another landfill locally is, is going to probably be a non-starter. Um, and, and so, you know, all of this, there are all these different factors that drive costs on both the single and multifamily side. But the, the reason we've emphasized contamination in this presentation is that's a big cost driver that we have total control over. Mm -hmm. With enough education and community buy-in, we could reduce rates just based on that one factor. But I know that the city is trying to mitigate it in other ways. And um, you guys discussed some of the possibilities. So if you want to talk about those real quick. Yeah, sure. So you're, you're right. We did. I mean, I wrote a memo back when, when we got this heads up in February. I, I submitted a memo that instructed staff to uh, come back telling us what we could do to reduce. We talked about that 21% yeah. increase that was forecast. It's looking like it's going to be more like 17% roughly. Uh, we had asked them what else we could do. And they looked at four main options. So one was to freeze staff hiring. The, the challenge there is it doesn't, there's not a lot of unopened positions and of the few that are unopened. So it doesn't, doesn't have a big impact on rates. We also are very thinly staffed. We have few, as with all of our departments in San Jose, and we've talked about this in other sessions, we're a big city with a small budget. We just have few staff per capita. So to deliver services, we need to fill the, the positions we have open and it doesn't have that big of an impact on, on rates. Use uh, fund reserves, we are gonna do that. So 2% of the decrease from what was initially mentioned mm -hmm. to where we are now 
is going to come from using some of our reserves. That gives us a year to kind of get through this COVID surcharge, if you want to call it that, but we, we're going to need to get contamination rates down because it's not sustainable to use reserves more than one time. Um, reduction to current services. This was analyzed, and I agree with staff that reducing the junk pickup. So if we we have this great service, everyone should be aware of, and, and maybe we can, you know, we'll, we'll advertise this again to folks. But you can basically call your hauler and say, "I've got a bunch of junk that doesn't fit in my trash can. Can you come pick it up?" And you can schedule a pickup, and you can put out a bunch of items, a lot of different stuff, and. It's, you know, what we discovered, what's important here, and the reason that we don't want to get rid of it is, number one, eliminating it would only reduce rates by about 1%. So the 17% that we talked about, you would get a 1%, so you'd go to 16% increase, you would have a 1% impact on the rate increase. So that's not a ton, um, I should say one percentage point impact, to be clear. Um, but we would probably spend that much or more dealing with the blight that would be generated by eliminating that happening. service. Yeah. We know that, yeah, when we don't do junk pickup and make it easy and accessible for people, folks get on Yelp, they call you know, the, the guy with the pickup truck who says he can pick it up for 20 bucks. And I guarantee you, if anyone with a pickup truck is picking up your trash for 20 bucks, or even 50 bucks, frankly, it's probably not going to a landfill. It's probably getting illegally dumped somewhere in our city or nearby. And then we have to pay city staff to go do blight removal and go pick it up. And so it's this self-defeating kind of thing. So it's better to do prevention and have the junk pickup service and it doesn't drive up rates that much. And then finally, we are looking, this is the one piece that we're still not sure about. We need to understand more about the federal stimulus funds. We're gonna have, an influx of one-time money from the federal government tied to the American Rescue Plan. And we will see if we can use some of that to offset rates, particularly because with the co with COVID, there is this sort of one-time impact here that we might be able to help mitigate. So there's still still some work to be done there, but that's kind of where we're, where we're at. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where I kind of want to like wrap things up. Like there is a lot of work to be done, not just like bring down rates. So like for me, I consider it being a good neighbor, recycling correctly, keeping rates down for everyone. But like this is the planet we have. And we really do got to recycle, reuse and reduce, reuse and reduce. Uh, you asked me about why I could find that old uh, recycling bin. My parents use them for compost bins now. And I don't know how long it's been since we used those bins. They're there are people watching this who probably will not recognize those bins. So this is the planet we have, and we have to make the best use of all our resources because uh, th this is where you're raising your kids and where I'm going to someday, and I want to give them a healthy planet. Totally. Yeah, good work, Mr. and Mrs. Barcelos. I, I love that you guys are reusing those bins. That's awesome. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think there's there's a lot of reasons to care about this. And um, it's it's an issue that doesn't get enough attention, but it is, a, it is a core service from the city. And in honor of Earth Day, we wanted to give you an update, both, you know, because rates matter and have an impact on, on everyone, um, but also because this is one of the most important and accessible things that we, we can all do. We, this is within our control. I think by, by knowing what you can recycle and how to recycle. And, and I think, Liz, you know, it might be fun to do a follow-up to this where we go even deeper into the actual recycling process, but also just what, what can go into that bin. Maybe we can get somebody out to help us understand what you can and can't recycle and how to, how to do it right. I want to go through your bins and make sure Nina's not putting her iced coffee in the recycling anymore. There we go. Oh, we're going to blame it on Nina. I like that. <laughs> it's either her or Luca that's got the iced latte habit, apparently. Uh, but yeah. yeah, obviously. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching, everyone. We hope you learned something. And if you enjoy explainers like this, uh, let us know in the comments anything else you'd like us to dive deeper into, because I know I enjoy doing these things. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. This was great. Really appreciate it. Happy Earth Day. Yeah, happy birthday.